Around this time of year, some are celebrating Easter and others are celebrating Passover. Whichever one, it's always a great time to be thinking about forgiveness. So we invited Dr. Jennings, top psychiatrist and Christian author, to join us to talk about forgiveness and to destroy some of the myths around forgiveness. Like the one that says forgiveness should only be granted if someone has apologized. Here's Dr. Jennings' response. This myth um, is based on this idea that there's some type of contractual legal aspect. You can't grant the pardon until the person actually admits they're wrong. Uh, but it misunderstands the very purpose and function of forgiveness. The purpose and function of forgiveness is not to change the person who's done the wrong. It's to change the person who's been wronged. It frees us from bitterness, resentment, hostility, anger. It doesn't change the other person. It doesn't cause them to be trustworthy or, or bring them to repentance. It doesn't restore the relationship. Because if somebody who has wronged you, you forgive them in your heart, they're still against you. They're still, you still can't trust them. Yeah. So, but it does for you from hostility. And, and, and when you think about the forgiveness aspect, I've seen people who think they forgive, but they're doing it from a very, shall we say, legalistic approach. We were commanded by you know, the Lord to forgive, so I've forgiven. But it means I'm not going to seek revenge, but I'm looking forward to the day when the Lord punishes you for what you've done. Right. Okay. There's really no forgiveness in the heart there. No. Forgiveness means you've, you've let go of the bitterness. You actually have in your heart a, a desire for the, for the restoration and healing and, and repentance and transformation of the person who's done you wrong. You want to see them recovered to righteousness. That's, that's a big step, though. It's a huge step. Yeah. And, and where you can get around that and you can start moving your heart that direction is when you think about you've been done wrong by somebody you love. You've done wrong, like your child told a fib, or your child stole a cookie, or your husband you know, let you down in some way, your spouse did something, and you, you forgive them because you, you love them, and you really do want to see them come around where you can trust them. Mm. And I guess it's easier with someone who you love. That Your example earlier of the, the brother-sister relationship, yeah. that must have been tough because of he felt so wronged. But um, what constitutes, it, it, while we're thinking about apologies, what constitutes a real apology? Uh, you know, if we apologize to well, someone. Well, I, I like how you brought like. this word up because what you did there is so nice, as mo many people do, is they interchange apology and forgiveness, and they're not the same. Mm. You can apologize because um, you socially don't want tension, you don't want to get uh, some consequence in your workplace, you don't want to lose a, a promotion, uh, but you actually have no real forgiveness in your heart or repentance if you're the one apologizing. Right. Um, you just don't want the consequence of what's happened. True repentance, true sorrow is actually sorrow for what's going on in your heart that led you to do an act of injury to another person in the first place. And, uh, and the issue of true forgiveness, in my understanding of it, requires a genuine um, altruistic concern and regard for the other person. Uh, many Christians, uh, I think, are, are trapped in this idea of, oh, I've forgiven, but I still hate that person in my heart, mm. and I, and I want to see them pay. That's not really forgiveness. It's kind of a legal mechanism they go through. Mm. But real forgiveness is something that changes your heart where you have concern for that other person. And, and so much of forgiveness, you, you're using the word legal here, is because there is this balance of, or this tension between justice and forgiveness, or you know that grace that you want to offer somebody. And um, so if I was to ask to actually come and apologize, what should my apology look like? Well, should I wanna, I I can I just say, oh, I'm sorry, but how can you know I, that I've forgiven? Well, I, and I, I know I, this is not about forgiveness. No, 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 but I want to pick up on something you said about the justice piece. What yes. impairs people from doing this? One of the other myths is this idea, if I forgive and they haven't been held accountable, they haven't been caught by the law. Say I, was, I deal with patients who have been molested as kids. Okay, and uh, no, they, the perpetrator's never caught, never punished, and, and they have this sense of, well, if I forgive, it's like they get away with it. Mm. Okay, this misunderstands the fundamental nature of reality and how reality works now we're designed. You can never perpetrate evil upon another person without injuring and damaging yourself. Most of my patients don't see this, so I, I walk them through a little um, uh, question, analogy. I ask them first, you know, when you were being mistreated and you were being abused, who do you think got damaged worse? You are the person who was molesting you. They always say me. I said, okay, let's take that at face value. I said, let's imagine now that God just took you to heaven and he says, I'm going to send you back to earth and I'm going to give you one choice between two options. When you go back, you can go back exactly where you were. Nothing has changed in your life. You just pick up where you went. Or I will let you change lives with a man who molested you and you get to go around molesting kids, but no one molests you. Whose life do you choose? 
100% of my patients choose their own. And I said, why? And, they, and the light goes on. They say, you know, when somebody exploits us, they can damage our body, they can damage our emotions, they can damage our reputation, they can damage our finances, but they cannot see our conscience, they cannot damage our souls, they cannot warp our characters. But when you perpetrate evil upon another person, you sear your conscience, you warp your character, and you sully your soul. No one ever gets away. And so when we, when we have this forensic legal view of things, well, it's a crime committed, we have to ex, uh, uh, commit an external punishment, we actually miss how reality's working. It would be no different than saying, well, that person's smoking two packs a day, we've got to punish them for that. No, they're damaging them themselves with every cigarette they smoke. When we perpetrate evil, we're destroying ourselves, taking our further and further out of harmony with how life is actually built by God to operate and ultimately destroy ourselves. It's true, we don't get away with sin. We have more from Dr. Jennings after the break, so stick around. And we're back. During her senior year in high school, Kate was hit by a drunk driver. Two years on, a sermon series on forgiveness made her realize how much her unforgiveness was hurting her and not him. I felt a huge change in myself after that series and I remember telling a friend of mine that I had to start praying while I was in the shower because I would cry every time and I started to realize the power of prayer and through all of that I felt like it was God's way of saying I've got this just trust me and just put your faith in me and I feel like he wanted me to stop looking back and to start moving forward and the power of prayer was one of the ways that I felt like I could do that. And instead of hating the man who hit me, I started to pray for him. And I feel like the power of forgiveness and the power of prayer together is what made me transform. I felt like my walk in faith started on the day of the accident. I just didn't know it at the time. And that's why I wanted to be baptized on January 20th. I was able to share my story with the church at Sunday at 5 and after that everyone kept telling me how brave I was and thanking me and I just hoped that I could reach someone with my story and that people would understand what the power of forgiveness can do. Every time I looked in the mirror I saw scars and pieces of glass that were still lodged in my face and it was daily reminders of pain and suffering and days that I could never get back. And today the scars are still there and the pieces of glass are still lodged in my face, but today they're daily reminders of love and healing and forgiveness. Only by God's grace can we turn our loathings into symbols of love. Another myth about forgiveness is that if we have forgiven someone but no longer trust them, then our forgiveness cannot be real. Here's Dr. Jennings to address this myth with a story. I had a patient who came to see me very distraught because her husband had just cheated on her for the sixth time. And what had transpired prior to coming to see me, first time he cheated on her, she threw him out. He ran to her pastor, fell down on his knees, cried, bawled, I, I committed a terrible sin, I've asked the Lord Jesus to forgive me, but my wife just threw me out. Pastor picks him up, takes her to the wife and says, look, you know the Lord Jesus has forgiven you of all your sins, can't you see your way clear to forgive your husband and take him back? So she did. And he cheated on her the second time, and the same thing, and the third time, and the same thing, and the fourth time, fifth time. Now, at the sixth time, she's here about to completely collapse because she knows her husband is going to be coming with the pastor saying, can't, can't you take him back? And so I pointed out to her, we walked through, the importance of forgiving in her heart frees her from bitterness, resentment, and carrying with her anger through the rest of her life helps her heal from the wrong done to her. But forgiving another person doesn't make them trustworthy. And until she can trust the person, and that what makes them trustworthy is a true repentance, a true change of heart motive, where they actually come to love another person more than themselves. And um, so she forgave him, but didn't let him move back in. Mm. And we talk about trustworthiness, there's two types of untrustworthiness, and most people miss the second type. The first type is you've got the perpetrator, the, the, the evil person like the terrorist or, the, or the, um, the pedophile who actually intends to do harm. We can't trust people like that. Right. But there's another type of untrustworthiness. You are a treasurer at your church and you've got a six-year-old and, and you've got 5,000 in cash to take to the bank and your six-year-old says, well, I'll take that to the bank for you. Do you trust him with it? 
No, no not because no. they intend to do harm, but because they haven't matured to handle the responsibility. And there are many people who have never matured to experience self-restraint and self-governance. And so they find themselves in situations overcome by emotion and let their emotions carry them into behaviors that their judgment actually knows is, is, is wrong, like this man's affairs over and over again. He doesn't intend to, he's not planning when he does this to do harm. And so when he looks at his wife, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again, he means it. And so what's the core? How can you tell? You remember Peter in the upper room? Jesus says, you're all going to betray me. Peter says, not me, Lord. I wouldn't do it. Was Peter lying? No. No, he meant it. Does that mean Jesus could trust him? No, he no. couldn't, could he? No. See, this is a perfect example. So what was the issue? Peter loved Jesus, but he still loved himself more. And so when Peter had his life put on the line, at that point, when push came to shove, he denied Jesus to protect self. It was after his denial, when he went out and wept bitterly, that he died to self and, come, and came to love Jesus more than himself. And then he could be trusted. He wasn't perfect, so he made mistakes. But he could be trusted because he was willing to overcome those mistakes. And, and if you're looking to, if our audience is looking to, in a relationship, you need to ask the question, does the person I'm dating, the person I'm looking to marry, do they love me more than themselves? Or do they love themselves more than me? If they love themselves more than you, they'll eventually uh, uh, deny you to protect themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, there's the... The old adage, forgive and forget. Is forgiveness about forgetting? That's another great question. It's subtle because it's, it, it, in a certain way it is, but it's, it's really not. Okay, it's not about memory erasure. So imagine you have a, a child and your child stole a cookie or told a fib. And uh, it's a first grader. And you, in your heart, think about your first grader, six years old, told a fib. Do you have anger and resentment and bitterness in your heart toward them until the child repents and begs forgiveness? Or is your heart already forgiving toward the child and you want to lead the child to live an honest life? So you lead the child then with a, some act of discipline toward repentance, but you're already forgiving toward the child first. And the child repents, truly, I'm sorry, mommy, I didn't mean to tell the fib, and there's hugs and kisses and reconciliation happens, right? And so the next day when you come home and you see your child coming up the sidewalk, do you think, oh, here comes that little liar of mine? <laughs> No, when right. there's reconciliation, when there's both forgiveness and repentance and reconciliation has occurred, that sin, if you want to call it that, that wrong is removed from the relationship, it's forgotten as far as the relationship is concerned. Does that mean you now have amnesia, memory has been erased, and you have no recollection of what happened the week before? Absolutely not. No, so this idea in Christianity that forgiveness, when we, when we get forgiveness from God, there's erasure of heavenly record books or it's wiped out of memory, it, it is completely misunderstood. What, where it's wiped out of, it's wiped out of or not, it's forgotten from the relationship because it's not between us and God anymore. And does forgiveness make us more vulnerable? Does it open us up to being trampled on, becoming this, a doormat? This is a myth that many people struggle with, and they hold to, to their anger because their anger makes them feel strong. If anybody ever tries to do this to me again, I'm ready to pop their head. You see, so they, they won't forgive because they want to feel less vulnerable. That's exactly right. But I give them this metaphor. Imagine you went to Miami Beach, and you fell asleep on the beach at July, summertime, at 10 in the morning, and with no sunscreen, and you wake up at 5 in the afternoon terrible sunburn terrible sunburn you go home you've got aloe vera you've got just a white white t-shirt on you can't even lean back and your six-year-old jumps on your back to play what do you do you scream and you yank him off right. your husband comes up doesn't know your sunburn gives you a big bear hug what do you do uh, and same. you push them away and somebody actually slaps you on the back the point of the metaphor is when you're sunburned you lose the ability to tell the difference between touches of play touches of love and touches of aggression everything hurts and you push everyone away Right. People who don't forgive are, have this emotional sunburn. They're raw. They're hurting. And they won't let anybody get close to them. They, they, they push everyone away. They get hurt when they shouldn't get hurt. When somebody's just playing or someone's even being uh, compassionate, they get hurt. And so if you had that physical sunburn, is the best strategy to figure out a way no one ever touches you again or to heal the sunburn? Many people with emotional burns, these, these hurts of wounds, of emotional wounds, actually their approach is to try to put up barriers where no one ever gets close again. It's much better to focus on, let's heal the wounds that have been inflicted upon me. And by, by offering forgiveness, even internally, that's right. that, that is going to be the healing strategy. And forgiveness for isn't about going to the other person, writing them letters, calling them up, telling them. Forgiveness is about something you do in your heart, that your heart lets go and has forgiveness. But you, it may be the wisest course of action never to communicate with that person again. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. It's You're been welcome. great having you. Time has flown by, but I think we've learned more about forgiveness. Thank you so much. If you or a loved one is facing a mental health challenge, ask yourself if it's a hardware or a software problem. In other words, a brain problem or a spiritual problem such as guilt, unforgiveness or bitterness. 
For a spiritual issue, psychiatric medication is unlikely to help, but a spiritual remedy will. Our beliefs are what determine our responses and behaviours, so it's important to deal with these things that happen to us and form beliefs that are based on truths, not myths. And we've looked at a number of myths about forgiveness today. Those myths include having to earn forgiveness, or forgiveness meaning forgetting, or that once forgiven, we can trust the other person. Don't fall into those traps, but do work on healing past hurts so that you can form strong and supportive relationships. And if you need more information, then get Dr. Jennings' book, Could It Be This Simple? That's all from me today. Thanks for joining us on Go Healthy for Good. I'll see you next time.